what really uh, excites us is that we are seeing results. We are seeing the results of our work, which really excites us and gives us the energy to do more. Because we know that at the end of the day, it's not the number of the food packages that we have distributed what matters. What matters is the number of lives that have been changed. This is a wide open mission field in the freest democratic country in the Middle East called Lebanon. This is our moment in history to make a difference. How dare we not at least prayerfully consider reaching those people with the love of Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. Hey, thanks for making it out in the snow. And yes, Danny, the snow is awesome. Uh, Tom, we are here with Tom Adama, the co-founder of Heart for Lebanon Absolutely. Ministries. Tom, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank Tom you. came in last night from uh, Asheville, North Carolina. I was going to say North Dakota, but North Carolina. Yeah, and uh, is leaving right after the service to head back home. And tomorrow he heads off to Lebanon again. So, Tom, we're grateful that you're here. It's a real privilege to be here. Camille and Hoda send their love and regards to everybody, and uh, I'll give them one big hug for you all tomorrow. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. So Heart for Lebanon is one of our six global mission partners on the map here. You'll see that we have partners <clears throat> all around the world, and these six are ones that we have made a commitment to to support monthly and to build relationally into. Heart for Lebanon is one of those. This year, we are visiting three of our global partners. We're going to Nicaragua. We're going to Horizon International in South Africa. Africa. And in the end of November, as we're going to share in just a little bit, we're going to take a trip to Lebanon. So, Tom, welcome, and thank you so much for being here on our Global Mission Sunday. Tell us what's going on in Lebanon. It's been all over the news. Well, we could take a couple hours to do that. I mean, we could talk about the political mess that the country has been in for a number of years, and it's getting worse by the hour. The protests are still taking place. We could talk about the economic crisis, and that is extremely difficult at the moment. International Monetary Fund is there as we speak trying to correct it, and Hezbollah won't let them. And uh, since December, the economy in Lebanon has, uh, well, the inflation rate has grown 15% to let you know a little bit about the economic problems. We can look at it socially, but I like to look at it spiritually. I don't know about you, but I'm 71 years of age, and in my lifetime, there's never been an opportunity like there is today to reach the largest unreached people group inside Syria with the Great Commission. Mm. This is our Esther moment to reach Muslims with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How dare we not give it all we got before it's too late? Tom, can you explain a little bit about the, the Syrian civil war and the, the refugee crisis that's resulted? So the civil war took place, if you know Lebanese history, for 32 years, Syria ruled Lebanon. And Camille and Hoda were affected by that personally, even on their wedding day. Many of you know that story. Then you also have Joseph, and you have most every one of our 54 staff members. In fact, every one of our 54 staff members have been infected some way by a Syrian. Joseph's my hero. He's our second employee. He lost his brother by gunpoint in front of him by a Syrian soldier. His father was killed by a Syrian soldier. His mother was wounded and raped by a Syrian soldier. And yet, he sits in a tent today with Syrians, and he shares the love of Jesus Christ. In fact, I was there with him once, and this lady was complaining. 
You don't understand the Syrians and what they did to me and what they did to my family. And you don't understand it. You, you would hate them if you were in my shoes. And Joseph said, oh no, you don't understand. I have been affected by your Syrian army as well and told them what I just told you. The difference is I don't hate them. I love them. And I pray for them every day because it's Jesus Christ who made the difference in my life. So the map we just saw said that there's a million Syrian refugees that have poured into Lebanon, but that doesn't tell the whole story because Lebanon no. is a country of four million people, and on top of that four million, how many refugees are there? So you have four million Lebanese, two million refugees, 700,000 are Palestinian, 1.5 million, 1.4 million are Syrian refugees. So two million refugees. That's a basically like doubling the population west of the Mississippi in less than a year. It's like I don't know what your population of Casper 55, is. 55, 60,000. 55, 60,000 is being like adding 30,000 to your population in six months in Casper. What does it do to your infrastructure? What does it do to your social structure? What does it do to you name it? But it's a golden opportunity for the church. Don't dare miss it. You know, um, Tom, the paradigm of our faith promise journey is Abraham. Yeah. And he's a guy that God came to and spoke to and said, listen, I want to bless you. I want to make you a blessing. And Genesis 12, God says five times the word blessing is used. Five times there, which is fascinating because um, five times the word curse is used up to that point after the fall. And so a lot of scholars think that God through Abraham is basically saying, look, in relationship with me, I will reverse the effects of the curse that has fallen on humanity as you come to know me. And God told Abraham, look, follow me. I will bless you and I will make you a blessing to the nations. Last week we talked about Abraham didn't always do it perfectly. He was a human like us. He is not the Messiah. He is not the Savior. He was a fallen man, yet he followed God with a passion. And today we're going to see a story where God revisits Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. God comes to him because God had said, listen, I'm going to give you a son. The challenge is God had delayed. He doesn't always work on our timetable the way that we'd like. So God actually shows up to Abraham here in Genesis chapter 18 in something that we call a theophany, which basically just means God is showing up in flesh, which is cool because uh, sometimes we think of God as out there or up in the sky. But even in the Old Testament, before the incarnation of Jesus, God is active and present and working in the world. So in Genesis 18, we're going to see this story of Abraham's hospitality. And what you guys do in Lebanon is basically provide well, hospitality. You love people in Jesus' name, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their religion or race, and you serve them in Jesus' name, and you make a difference. Absolutely. We're going to hear some stories about that in a minute. I just want to take us to the word here in Genesis chapter 18, and I just want to see how God is actively involved in Abraham's story, and how Abraham makes this courageous choice to serve these visitors who he doesn't quite know who they are, but he'll find out later. So in Genesis 18, 1, it says this, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then may, all, may wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they said. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. He didn't say please, but that's another story. So I think this is a, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that to my wife, but I guess Abraham and Sarah had that relationship. So anyway, Sarah, prepare the lunch because we've got some special visitors here. Then he ran ahead of the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. So here's Abraham offering this lavish hospitality in the near Middle East in the ancient times that maybe you'd be given a meal of vegetables or bread, whatever you had on hand, but Abraham made it extra, extra special for these guests. He really rolled out the red carpet and he said he stood there as they ate in the Middle East, oftentimes the host won't sit with the guest. He'll stand there as a gesture of saying, I'm, I'm here to wait on you, whatever you need. It's like a, a server in a restaurant doesn't sit down with the people. So Abraham is serving the Lord here. In verse 9, where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now you have to understand, they waited about 15 years for this. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind him and Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself and she thought, 
after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Which is an echo of what the angel Gabriel said to Mary. I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah's afraid, so she lied and said, I didn't laugh. But he said, yeah, you did laugh. The Lord always gets the last word, by the way. So here we have Abraham offering this radical hospitality. And what I think is fascinating about it is Abraham is serving God. Abraham puts water and washes the feet. Abraham gives a meal. And in Hebrews chapter 13, it says, don't forget to practice hospitality because in doing so, some have entertained angels. Most likely a reference to this story. But even taking it one step further, Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, hey, when you serve someone else in my name, you're serving me. It's not just the person. You are serving me. And so Jesus flips the script and helps us understand, like Abraham, when he served others with practical physical needs, he was actually giving an offering of service and love to God. And that's what you do in Lebanon. That's exactly right. I mean, when you do things relationally, unconditionally, yet holistically, by that I mean you're going someplace, especially in the Muslim culture where hospitality is a big deal. When you come on a trip in November, when you come with the church, and you sit in, a, in one of these refugee tents, as poor as they are, because everybody we serve lives at or below the extreme poverty line, they will give you a cup of really hot sweet tea or really, really black coffee. <laughs> and it will be hot. And you can drink it, because if you don't, well, that's a sign that you're not taking their hospitality seriously. So all we do is serve them with family care, food, hygiene, whatever it needs they need to sustain life. But eventually, especially in a Muslim culture, they eventually say to you, so why are you doing this? Mm. And you've never asked for anything. The Muslims have kicked us out of Syria. We got into Lebanon, and there's Muslims all around us. They're not serving us, not even the Muslim NGOs. There is no such thing are serving us. But you're serving us. Why is that? Well, thank you for asking. It's because the love of Jesus Christ compels us to do this. Tom, can you share the story of the young man named Peter? Yeah. So a result of this, this unconditional aid is a, is a story I love to tell because I was there when Peter shared it with me and his mom. Uh, we have this policy, this practice, I guess you'd call it, when any student goes into our Hope Educational non-formal education, they have to stand before the class and share with the class how they got to Lebanon and what they want to be when they grow up, what's their dreams, what's their hopes, what's their desires in life, because they've been all shattered. So the teacher said to Peter, now Peter's his American name, his Arabic name is Mohammed, but that scares some of you, so I changed it to Peter. So Peter gets up in front of the class, stands up and gets out of his chair, looks the teacher straight in the eye and says, it was two o'clock in the morning. The bomb went off. Our whole family was together in the living room and the ceiling came down, the walls caved in. We went down a floor. I watched my dad die, my grandfather die. I looked over and I knew my grandmother was dead and my two older brothers were dead. My wife, came, my, my mom came in with her nightgown and picked my little sister up under one arm and grabbed me under the other arm and dragged us out of that rubble. And somehow we made it with those clothes on our back a couple weeks later in the country of Lebanon where Heart for Lebanon started to serve us and just treat us like human beings, people that had dignity. And here I am in the classroom. So the teacher looked at Peter and said, Peter, that's pretty much like every other story, but what do you want to be when you grow up? What's your dreams? What's your hope? And if a nine and a half year old could stand up any prouder and t taller and straighter, he did and looked the teacher in the eye and he said, teacher, I want to be a terrorist when I grow up. And just like you, it sucked the air right out of the room. You want to be a terrorist when you grow up? And Peter said, exactly. I've been going to school since I was age five. My father and grandfather took me five days a week from eight in the morning to five at night. No lunch break, no play grid, nobody to love me, nobody to listen to my story. Just tell me how to kill somebody. Mm. Just tell me how to shoot a gun so I can revenge my great, great grandfather's death. If you go in November, you might not meet Peter. But if you meet Peter, go ahead. 
ask him, Peter, what do you want to be when you grow up? He'll look you straight in the eye, shoulders back, and say, I want to be a peace officer. I want to share what Jesus has in here to my people back in Syria. I don't know if I want to be a preacher or a police officer, but I want to be a teller. That's his words, a teller of Jesus because I love Jesus. I learned Jesus at Heart for Lebanon. And it started because somebody was willing to sit in a tent and just listen and then do what we could to share the love of Christ. Yeah. So Tom, um, a mission board this year here at Highland Park has made a commitment that uh, we're going to focus on Lebanon and above and beyond what we normally give and above and beyond what we give to our global and our local partners and other projects. We want to do a special project with you because of the crisis that's taking place in, Syria, uh, in Lebanon through Syria and the hundreds of thousands of, of Kurdish refugees that are pouring across the border. So can you explain that project? Yeah, so 10 years ago this March 10th, this, the, believe it or not, the, the Syrian civil war started mm. because five boys wrote graffiti on a wall and Assad said, we're not having that in my country, tried to squelch it, and it spread. Wow. 10 years later, you have all these displaced people the country of Syria, in my humble opinion, will never be put back together again. Everybody that's in Lebanon from the Syrian descent has been, who's been born has no birth certificate. All kinds of crises are taking place. And on top of all of that mess, and I don't know if our government knew what they were doing or not, but again, you can look at what our government did and you can have all kinds of discussions and you can have all kinds of arguments and at the end of the day, thank God that he allowed it to happen because today we are witnessing to more Kurdish people than ever we did before because they have no place to stay in northern Syria. Isn't it interesting that the first week of October, our new 62,000 square foot Hope Ministry Center and Hope Evangelical Church Zachley got approved and opened its doors to it that will allow us to double our capacity just as the Kurdish people are coming out of Syria into Lebanon. So this morning at Hope Evangelical Church Zachley, we had 210 Kurdish born again believers in Jesus Christ worshiping in their Kurdish service. That's on top of 230 Arabic-speaking Muslims who have come to faith in Jesus Christ because of family care in the same church. And because of your faithfulness and your giving, and more importantly, your prayers, you're going to help us with this Kurdish ministry because I got news for you. We didn't expect it. We didn't budget it. We didn't do anything to prepare for it except for God had the building ready. And now we have hope on wheels. We can put 250 of the kids in the classroom. We have all this opportunity that lies before us. Little did we know four years ago when Camille and I dreamed of this building, this is exactly what God wanted it for. Thank you, Tom. You know, I, I watch the news, um, and it breaks my heart to see families uh, pouring across the border, living in tent cities for years, kids born there, and that's all that they know. And, and I watch it, and I, sometimes I think, what can we do? Mm -hmm. How can I help? What can we do? And church, I want you to know that God has moved the pieces in such a way that you and I can actually make a difference. And there are three ways that we can do that. First, I want to ask you to commit to praying. Right after the service, Tom and, the, and others and our other global partners are going to be out there in the atrium with tables just kind of explaining the different ministries that we here at Highland support through Faith Promise. So I want you to pray. I want you to get some information and pray. Two, I want you to consider giving. Our mission is to take risks to pursue God and love like Jesus. And there are very few areas that challenge us as much as our finances. But please understand this. God has positioned Heart for Lebanon in such a way to minister to the needs of the people that are there. And by us just being willing to say, yes, God, I'm willing to be a vessel. If you will bless me, I will pass it on. Whatever number that is that God gives you in that faith promise, you fill out that card. If you would say, God, if you will give me 100 bucks, if you give me 200, if you give me 300, whatever it is, when I receive it, I will know it's from you and I will pass it on and that money will fund and fuel missions here in Casper and around the world and, and this year specifically globally with Lebanon. Now one of my mentors says, hey, never give your money where you yourself aren't willing to go and so one of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna go. We're gonna go to Lebanon. Uh, we're gonna 
meet refugees and we're going to pray with them and talk with them and we're going to hear what God has. So November 29th to December 5th, it's the weekend of uh, right after Thanksgiving. I'm inviting those of you that God would move. Now, not all of us can go. I understand that. We can only take one team, but, but all of us as a church are a part of it. So I really want to impress upon us that this is a team effort. What's happening here in Casper, what we talked about last week with USI, the Unaccompanied Homeless Initiative, Unaccompanied Students Initiative, where we opened two weeks ago a home for homeless teenagers. Yesterday, we finished work on the boys' side. That's going to be opening in about a month. God is at work here in Lebanon and across the world. God is at work. And church, I just want to encourage you that you are a part of this. So we're just going to take a minute, and I'm going to ask you to pull out that card, that Faith Promise Blessed to Bless card. And at the back, it says, join us on the journey. And here's the invitation. God invited Abraham on a journey. He said, look, follow me. I will bless you and you will be a blessing to the nations. He wasn't talking about finances. He was talking about Jesus, that through Abraham, the line of Jesus would come. But as God blesses us, that's one of the ways that we can be a blessing. The ushers are in the back. They have the cards. If you need one, just raise your hand. We're going to give you a minute to pray about this, to fill it out. And this is the time for us to say, God, I am willing to join you on the journey. I am willing to be a part of this process as you are helping to reach Kurdish refugees with the gospel of Jesus Christ, as you are helping to reach AIDS orphans in Africa to tell them the good news of Jesus, that God is equipping and empowering leaders in Nicaragua and in Peru and in Spain as a result of your giving and in India. So today, take one of these cards, and we're just going to give a moment to pray. And if you would, just join me as we pray. God, we thank you that you call us to be a part of the journey. Thank you, God, that we like Abraham, are blessed to bless, that we have received every blessing in Christ Jesus. And today, you've given us the invitation to be a part of what you're doing around the world. So give us courage. Help us to step out in faith. Help us to say, God, yes, I do trust you. I do believe that all the resources are yours, and you can use me as a vessel, as a channel to bless in Jesus' name. Amen.